Well, thank you. The title may frighten you, perhaps. It looks complicated. But what I, the purpose of my presentation today is actually a very simple one. I want to impress on you how important basic research is with regard to supporting a high quality of life at some time in the future. And if ever you have a chance to influence science policy, I hope that the lecture may give you some motivation to defend that as much as possible of public funds go to basic research and not to short-term research that should yield benefits within the next few months or years. Nuclear magnetic resonance is a physics principle and it is today used in practice, in daily life, to study macroscopic objects such as human bodies in medical diagnosis and it is used to study molecules at very many different levels from simple analytical analysis of chemical compounds to structural studies of large molecules and practical applications are, for example, uh, the development of new drugs. And yeah. Just an example, so you get such images from the use of nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, I don't think I, oh, I actually have a pointer. Great, this is my knee. And it was looked at in 1989, so approximately or exactly 31 years ago. Or I can look at molecules such as this protein, each line in here connects two atoms. So we have a, we see a, we get the three dimensional picture where we can place each and every atom in three dimensional space. So these are the, the main applications that we are used today to make based on the physics principle of nuclear magnetic resonance. Now what is NMR? NMR is best described in terms of quantum mechanics. You have isotope of all the elements which may or may have a nuclear spin that's different from zero. If the spin is zero, you cannot do NMR. If the spin quantum number is one half, then you are in business. If the spin quantum number is larger than one half, then you can still do exciting experiments, but you are not really in business. So we'll always concentrate on isotopes that have a nuclear spin of one half. Now this spin quantum num number of one half has two eigenstates, minus one half and plus one half. In the absence of a magnetic field, the two eigenstates of the spin quantum number are degenerate and you cannot actually detect the two different states. If you apply a magnetic field 
then the two states get energetically different. And this is called the Zeman effect. It was discovered in 1996. Of course, uh, Dr. by a student who was at the time 25 years old, by the way. And uh, of course, he had no idea that there would ever be nuclear magnetic resonance. He was just curious and discovered these uh, split these energy splittings in the fine structure of optical spectra of well-chosen uh, chemicals. Now, this energy gap between what is now called the Zeeman levels, I mean, Zeeman got the second physics Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1902. So, energy difference between the two Zeeman levels is very small. This energy difference corresponds to frequencies in the radio frequency range. And there was no way at the beginning of the last century that one could detect transitions between these energy levels. This became possible after thousands of scientists during the Second World War worked on refining radar technology to detect enemy planes. And after the war, when these uh, scientists came back, some of them went to universities, immediately used the technologies that they had developed during the war, and that enabled them to observe transitions between the Zeeman levels and uh, that, for example, Felix Bloch, a student of my university, the ETH Zurich, who then worked at Stanford, and Edward Purcell, they got the Physics Nobel Prize in 1992 for having performed the first NMR experiments. As I said, this happened in 1946, immediately within months after they returned from service during the war, back to academic life, and used the technologies that had been developed for radar detection of enemy place. Let me now talk about the two main applications that are of interest to me these days separately. The first is about the use of NMR in structural biology. Now, I could expand this and talk about NMR in analytical chemistry. Whenever a chemist makes a new compound, or if you go through a chemical synthesis for 24 steps, you will use NMR 50 times to check of after each step whether you have had success with your chemical synthesis, but this is not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about using NMR to get three-dimensional structures at atomic resolution by NMR in solution. Now, the important point here is that we can see the structures in solution. Now, why is this important? Structures have, long before we came in, with this technology have been determined in crystals by X-ray crystallography. However, proteins are not active in crystals. They are active in body fluids. Or when they are within membranes, they are active in contact with body fluids, and body fluids are aqueous solutions. So the new advance here is that we can now look at the molecules of life in, the, in an environment that is very close to their natural environment. And so applications, the most exciting applications now uh, regarding uh, the quality of human life is to use such structures to find new drug molecules. This, uh, you see here a drug 
that is bound very specifically to a larger protein. This is a very important drug. It opens the door to, for uh, organ transplantation in human medicine. This is old work. This is from the 1980s. It was one of the major breakthroughs together with Sandos, with a, uh, with a pharmaceutical company that today is part of Novartis. And uh, cyclosporin A is still used as a drug, usually in combination with other drugs to anyone who gets an uh, organ transplant. The, the immune suppression means that these drugs prevented the rejection of foreign tissue in the human body when a part of another body is transplanted. That can be a cornea, that can be a heart, that can be a kidney, just to make clear what I'm talking about. Well, what I'm working on these days, I mean, for the last 15 years, mostly in California, uh, presently mostly at Shanghai Tech University in Shanghai, is to work on GPCRs, G-protein coupled receptors. Now, G-protein coupled receptors are plentiful in our bodies. We have, according to the best available results, 826 different GPCRs in our body. And these GPCRs support uh, major physiological functions. And therefore, they are important targets for drug design. The numbers are that presently about 35% of all FDA-approved drugs target GPCRs. And of the 826 GPCRs, only about 40 have so far been targeted for drug development. So there is a huge uh, area open for future research in, this, uh, in the area of drug development. And while we are not so, I'm personally, I'm not so much uh, interested in drug development. It's very exciting to provide the basis for this. And I, I give you a brief survey of what the questions are that we have to address when we work with GPCRs. What you see here in this schematic drawing is a cell membrane from a human cell. This is the outer side, so that's the surface of the cell. This is the inside, and here we have the cytoplasmic interior of the cell. The thickness of the biological membrane is about 30 angstrom. When we apply drug molecules to the GPCR, the drug, most drugs so far bind in this position, which is referred to as the orthosteric ligand binding site. And we have in all GPCR, all say 826 GPCRs, have a transmembrane domain with seven transmembrane helices. And uh, I mean, there has been a very large, there is a very large literature about the physiological functions of pharmacology and so on. And it was very late that three dimensional structures could be determined. It was technically very difficult. So only in 2007 was the first structure of a human GPCR determined by X-ray crystallography. And now we have about 40 different GPCRs, GPCR structures determined either by crystallography or by cryo-electron microscopy. But all these techniques use immobilized, strongly immobilized preparations of the 
membrane proteins. What we can do by NMR is to investigate how a signal that's elicited by the chemistry of the drug molecule is transferred over a distance of about 30 angstroms to partner proteins in the cytoplasm, which initiate a cascade of follow-up events that should lead to the de desired effect that we apply the drug for. And there are different pathways. For example, a pathway that leads to G proteins, pathway that leads to beta restin, and there are other uh, pathways leading to kinases. Now I give you an example which is very much in the news these days. Opioids are received by GPCRs. And worldwide, but in particular in the United States, opioids have been very liberally prescribed to fight pain. And the, this desired effect of opioids is signaled through G proteins. However, there are side effects due to the signaling to beta restin. And as the name already indicates, it arrests something. It arrests breathing. And so if individuals somehow get access to larger quantities of prescription opioids than they should apply, they may completely stop breathing, leading to death. In the United States, it is, uh, it is so that since 2010, about 400,000 people have died from an overdose of prescription opioids. In 2016 alone, it was 60,000 deaths, and the number is increasing. In the, it's a big political issue at the moment that you may have noticed in the, in the news all over, I mean, in, in the US, of course, but also in Europe. This is a, has been a very hot issue during the last uh, two years. And measures are now being taken to develop opioid derivatives that would have negligible uh, signaling through the beta restin pathway. Now, what we, with our techniques, we are able to distinguish between the two signaling pathways and to check on the suitability of new compounds for uh, the use, for improved use as painkillers with less side effects than, have had, than we have had and which have led to these disastrous uh, uh, disease, uh, disastrous number of deaths in the USA alone. Now, this structural, uh, this use of NMR in structural biology was uh, largely developed at the ETH in Zurich by Professor Ernst and uh, myself. And we both got the Nobel Prize and got the Chemistry Prize in 1991. I got it in 2002. And you see the collaboration. Richard would work on the instruments and I would wear a tie and look on. Now let me change to the second important role of magnetic, res uh, magnetic resonance in biology and biomedical research, and that is magnetic resonance imaging. So the imaging of macroscopic objects. Now here I can trace the origins of this method to 200 years of basic research for the following reason. When you look at the human body, you only see the water. It, in no image that has been taken in clinical use has anything been observed but water molecules. 
And the brain has been the first organ that was in detail studied by MRI because our brain consists to about 80% of water. So it is an ideal uh, organ to be studied by MRI, also because it doesn't move around. I mean, the heart moves, so you have to, uh, to adjust the technology uh, to look at the heart, the lung is now, the, the kidneys, every, every uh, part of the body that, is, that contains a large amount of water is observed by MRI. Now, what is the reason for this? It is due to the Brownian motion of the water molecules and the inhibited motion of all the other parts of the body when we apply the NMR methodology. And it's the same. I mean, in the body, the situation for the resonance condition is very similar to what we use when we study molecules in solution. In 1826, an English botanist, Robert Brown, observed this Brownian motion. It's called after him. What happened to him was that he lost some pollen from a plant that he was studying. The pollen fell into a beaker of water. He took a microscope and discovered that the pieces of pollen on the surface of the water would move around. They wouldn't just sit still. That was for very surprising to him. He published this in 1827, but the question of why we had Brownian motion, and I mean there's only translational uh, Brownian motion, it, it, it was left as a secret. Until Albert Einstein in 1905 took up the question of why Brown had observed these movements of the pollen and the water, and he came up with statistical mechanics, which explained what was going on. The thermal agitation of the much smaller solvent molecules that bombard the dissolved uh, particles lead to a stochastic motion of the suspended particles. And this ended with the Stokes-Einstein relation, which says essentially that smaller particles change direction of the translational uh, Brownian motion at higher frequencies at larger particles because of the increased inertia of the larger particles. And most important for NMR, it, uh, I mean, this was the first, uh, the first paper by Einstein in May 1905, and he explained why, this, uh, why we had these translational motions. And then uh, it took him apparently about six months of uh, studies in the patent office in Bern in Switzerland to discover that he should also consider collisions of the solvent molecules that do not go straight onto the surface of the solute, but uh, uh, along the surface, and they would induce rotational motions. And so he wrote the second paper that appeared in January 1906 that explains the rotational Brownian motion, and that's the one that relates to NMR spectroscopy. And it says very simply that uh, let me, I think I have, uh, well, I don't have any details. So let me just describe with these pictures. It says essentially that small molecules give sharp NMR lines and molecules that move slowly give broad NMR lines and particles that do not move like bones, fat, muscles, they get so broad lines that you can't see them. It's very easy to filter those out. The only molecules in the human body that you can see in MRI are the smallest molecules that we have in our body, and that's the water. 
So, uh, so you then get short pictures. You see, this is again uh, one of my knees, but it's 30 years after the first pictures that you have seen. And uh, you see that a lot of progress has been made between 1989 and I think this was 2016. And so we now get short pictures. You see here another picture of the spine. That's also my spine. And see, it's amazing how sharp you see all the soft parts in the uh, vertebra and so on. The Nobel Prize for MRI went to Paul Lauterpur and to Peter Mansfield in 2003. I think I finished by giving you some insight into uh, the difficulties that you may have when you introduce new technology into clinical use. We were using uh, magnetic resonance imaging long before it was generally applied in the clinic. And because this was very early, we studied children because we only had a small magnet, which would not have fitted an adult human body, but it fitted babies and children up to age about 18 months. And uh, this is a group of uh, students and colleagues in uh, the Children's Hospital in Zurich who uh, made this research possible at the time. This was in the 19. 80s. Now, in the 1980s, the magnet that you used for MRI was a frightening structure like this here. See, and then you have to get into this, uh, into this tube, and there's a lot of noise during the recording of the data. Uh, this is a whole body. Uh, this is one of the first whole body uh, magnets that was constructed. Now we had a smaller one with only 40 centimeters bore for studies with children. So we had to solve problems that were quite straightforward for physicists and engineers. We had to develop uh, all the uh, equipment that was needed to monitor the state of uh, the baby while it is in the magnet. I mean, it, have, it had to breathe. It had, uh, we had to check the heartbeat and so on. And the most important part of the technology was to have a piece of uh, cotton or a piece of, uh, well, it's actually a fissile attached to one of the legs, and when the baby stopped breathing, we could pull, and then it would, in most cases, pull on the leg, and it would, in most cases, breathe again. And then we would get images like this, very sad images. See, that's a 17-year-old baby, which had a heavy concussion from a, a mechanical impact during birth. And now we had a special problem here. To see, these babies were very sick when the Essex Commission would permit that we would actually investigate their state with this technology. Each case had to be individually, we had to get individual permission. And then the children were very weak and it was not reasonable to even think about sedating them with chemicals. So we would invite the parents to come into the room with the magnet and hold the baby until he fell asleep, and then we would put it in the magnet. Now the baby didn't mind, but the parents were scared when they saw the magnet. And so what we did to introduce the technology <laughs> was to build a fairy house uh, this is uh, Chris Bush. He, uh, he subsequently became head of radio radiology at the University of Bern. And so, at least before the results came out of the investigations, it was a relatively happy-looking setup 
for these early studies. The last point I want to make is to give you again an idea. You have now seen that when we look at MRI today, and it's the same for studies of molecules in solution, we have to go back to Mr. Brown in 1826, 27, and then to Einstein, and then to Bloch, and Purcell, and none of these guys had the slightest idea that there would ever be MRI. It was so far off. There, you see, there were no computers when these scientists worked. And they were just curious, and they, they found something that was interesting, and the use came to light only 50, 80, in one case, 200 years later. Now here with the last example, I want also to show how the different approaches can converge in important ways. And we, uh, this has to do with hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin is a red protein in our blood. It's much talked about because you need a lot of hemoglobin to run fast and a long time. In endurance sports, it is very typical that, uh, that uh, athletes cheat, dope, use doping techniques to increase the hemoglobin content of the blood. And so so uh, it is a much talked about molecule, and it's also easy to see because it's red. So, uh, and this is, a, this is a schematic drawing of hemoglobin. It was also the first protein for which the structure was determined. And for what I'm going to discuss here, it's important that there are four oxygen binding centers in this molecule. The oxygen, I mean, hemoglobin binds oxygen in the lungs and then transports the oxygen into the brain, into the body, everywhere in the body, then comes back after having unloaded the oxygen and gets back into the lung to be reloaded. Now, when the, I, when the hemoglobin has oxygen bound, then the iron in these centers is diamagnetic. And when the oxygen is unloaded, the iron center becomes paramagnetic. Now, the, magnet, the magnetic strength of the electrons here is about a thousand times stronger than the magnetic uh, strength of the nuclei that we look at. And as soon as we get uh, paramagnetic center, it has, a it has a dramatic effect on the, on the NMR uh, behavior of the water near it. Now it happened that in around 1970, I was studying hemoglobin, my own hemoglobin at Bell Telephone Laboratories. And then a Japanese scientist, Dr. Seiji Ogawa, joined our group and learned how to do NMR with hemoglobin in solution. 25 years later, he had the ingenious idea that when he now used this change of from diamagnetic to paramagnetic state of the hemoglobin in imaging, he could follow the flow of the blood in the body. And so now uh, we have, well, the expression is here, we have functional MRI. That means we don't now just get a picture of the brain, but we can follow the blood flow in the brain. We'll immediately see if there is a blockage. And more interestingly, we will see which parts of the brain get activated in certain body functions. So uh, psychologists now use the technique to study what happens in the brain when individuals look at the stock market index and see their stock going up or going down. That's a typical application of this 
functional MRI, and there are even more important applications. I just mentioned this at the end because it is a very nice illustration of the merging of two different lines of research, which 30 years before functional MRI started, did not see a connection between the two. And all of a sudden, you have the right idea. It's important that you have the right idea at the moment when the supporting technologies are available to, uh, to be successful, to actually realize the idea, and then you get into the next state of uh, technology that can support improved quality of life for all of us. Thank you.